In the average U.S. history textbook, American history usually begins around 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue and discovered America. If I were writing the textbooks, it would start tens of thousands of years ago when humans first entered the continents. The settlement of the Americas is one of the final chapters of human migration, and it's an amazing narrative that bears witness to human ingenuity and resilience. Yet for how important this event is in American history, and world history for that matter, we don't completely understand how and when people arrived in the Americas. This has baffled scientists and scholars for centuries, and still does today, despite having more evidence and data at our disposal than ever. Why has this been such a difficult and frustrating question to answer? Let's cut to the intro and find out. Now before we go further, let's get some business out of the way. Some of you watching this may be getting a little deja vu because I already have an episode on this topic. That video just celebrated its third birthday, too. Why is Ancient America's rebooting this already? Can't creators just leave their films alone? These are valid questions, but I assure you there are important reasons for revisiting this topic. For those who have been paying close attention to the archaeological news, there's been a lot of very important discoveries that have changed our understanding of human migration into the Americas. I don't want to have a video on such an important topic that I consider obsolete in very important aspects. Also, after reviewing the previous episode, I felt that while the episode was a good effort for the time, I can do a much better job now and more comfortably incorporate different evidence from important fields, like genetics, rather than relying solely on archaeology. Also, this is going to be a fun example of how a few years can completely change and challenge our understanding of a given topic, so I think we can revisit this topic with a fresh perspective. With that out of the way, let's get started. To tell the beginning of this story, we need to turn our attention away from the Americas to East Asia between 40,000 and 20,000 years ago, the twilight of the Pleistocene, more commonly known as the Ice Age. During this time, much of the Earth's water was locked up in huge glaciers and sea levels were much lower than they are today. This meant that eastern Siberia and Alaska were connected by a land bridge called Beringia that stretched from the Lena River in modern Russia to the Mackenzie River in Canada. Check it out. Prior to this time, humans had already spread rapidly throughout Eurasia from Africa. By the time of the events we're discussing, humans were already in Australia. The success of these migrations was due to their ability to create increasingly sophisticated tools, clothing, and shelter in a variety of environments. I want to make it very clear that these people were modern humans in every sense of the word. These aren't the grunting cavemen that you see in old Far Side cartoons. They would have had songs, art, philosophy, politics, and embarrassing parents and relatives. These people would have been biologically indistinguishable from you and me. Now, in telling this story, I'm going to simplify things, and I just want you to know that the science behind this is a lot more complicated. If you're really interested in the nitty-gritty details, check out the bibliography, especially the book Origin by Jennifer Raff, which was a huge help in the research for this episode. Anyways, during this 20,000-year time period, there was an important genetic event that occurred within the East Asian population, according to current genetic studies. This occurred sometime around 39,000 years ago when a small group of people in East Asia separated from the main East Asian population into Western Beringia, or modern-day Siberia, hence their name, the ancient Northern Siberians. Now, this population wasn't completely isolated. There was some genetic contact between the ancient Northern Siberians and the East Asians for another 10,000 years or so. Now, some of you may be wondering how we know this in the first place, and that conclusion is based on the DNA that was recovered from an incredible site in northern Siberia called the Yana Rhinoceros Horn Site along the Yana River in Siberia. Excavations here revealed an incredible amount of tools, animal remains, and even art. Before this site was discovered, it was believed that no one was living in the Arctic until about 13 to 12,000 years ago, and the Yana site confirmed beyond a doubt that people were well adapted to survival above the Arctic Circle. What is most important to our story today, though, is that two human teeth were recovered from excavations at the site. 
The DNA recovered from these teeth show that the ancient northern Siberians had split from the East Asian population several thousands of years before. What's also interesting is that the DNA shows that these teeth didn't come from the same individual, but from two young boys. And what's wilder, these boys weren't closely related, which means that they were part of a large population living in the area, perhaps a thousand people or more. Around 33,000 years ago, a very important environmental shift began. Global temperatures began to cool, and the conditions began to dry out. This cooling episode is referred to as the Last Glacial Maximum, or LGM for short. During this time, glaciers began to expand, reaching their maximum extent between 26,000 and 20,000 years ago. In the Pleistocene, northern North America was covered by two enormous glaciers, the Laurentide Ice Sheet and the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. The ensuing temperature drops during the LGM expanded these ice sheets until they combined, sealing off North America from any overland access from Asia. To paint a picture of how massive these glaciers were, think of the wall from Game of Thrones. Pretty big, right? At its maximum, it would have been just over 3 kilometers high and covering over 9 million square kilometers. Ain't nobody getting over that. These colder and drier conditions made Beringia harsher and may have forced the ancient northern Siberians into new areas. Coincidentally, around this time, during the height of the LGM, an important encounter occurred. Genetic analysis shows that around 25,000 years ago, the ancient northern Siberians encountered the descendants of the East Asian population that they had split from before and mixed with them. This is important because the people born of this event produced the ancestors of almost all Native Americans today. Pinning this event to a geographical location is difficult due to the archaeological record from this time. In fact, the genomes that record this event come from a burial all the way from the Maltas site near Lake Baikal, though the site itself dates to thousands of years later. It's possible that these ancestral Native Americans, or at least some of them, migrated south to the Trans-Baikal region, but others speculate that this encounter would have occurred closer to home in East Asia, or in Beringia itself. Let's actually take a closer look at Beringia, the good old land bridge. You may be wondering when people fully settled the region, and scientists aren't really sure. It's possible that the ancient northern Siberians or their descendants were in East Beringia before the LGM, but archaeological evidence is scant. In fact, from 20,000 to 15,000 years ago, the archaeological trail goes cold, so it's very difficult to determine if and when people were living there. Now, on one hand, that isn't very surprising because most of Beringia, particularly central Beringia, is underwater today, and thus the best and most habitable areas from long ago haven't been properly investigated. One such area that these people may have inhabited is the southern Beringian coast. Paleo-environmental studies show that this area would not have been a steppe tundra, but rather a land of marshes and wetlands full of trees, animals, waterfowl, and marine resources. This coastal area would have been a very productive environment, and we'll see later why this could have forced the inhabitants to make some important adaptations. Its proximity to the ocean would have kept it much warmer than the interior. But that doesn't mean that people couldn't have lived further north on the northwest Beringian plain, which is also currently submerged today. How convenient. This would have been home to a host of different large mammals and megafauna, like mammoths, horses, saiga, woolly rhinoceros, and muskox. If you're a big game hunter who doesn't mind the cold, this would have been a great place. If this sounds a little crazy, it's worth remembering the Yana rhinoceros horn site, and noting that people were perfectly capable of surviving in the Arctic back then. Either way, trying to place these people in a specific place is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. The oldest archaeological evidence in eastern Beringia that currently exists comes from bluefish caves in northwestern Yukon. Here, some bones with butchering marks dating from 24,000 years ago were discovered in the 70s. It should be noted that no tools or human remains were found in the cave, and combining that with the very early dates made this an extremely controversial site at the time of its discovery. Although some recent analysis has supported the original conclusions, its place in the wider debate is still a bit controversial. The oldest unambiguous sites in eastern Beringia and modern Alaska don't appear until between 13,250 and 10,700 years ago, which is quite a bit later than we'd expect. 
Regardless of where this new ancestral Native American population was, genetics show that for several thousands of years, this population was isolated from the populations of East Asia, though probably not completely. This isolation event is referred to as the Beringian Standstill, or the Beringian Incubation. During this period, these ancestral Native Americans developed several distinct genetic traits that they would pass on to their descendants. At the same time, genetics show us that this population split into three groups, the ancestral Native Americans, ancient Beringians, and a third group that we'll get into later. The ancient Beringians are actually pretty fascinating, but don't get a ton of attention in the literature because there are no known modern populations that carry their genetic lineage. Ancient Beringian DNA has been recovered from three burials at the Upward Sun River site in Alaska, and no known modern populations descend from them. Why these people left no modern genetic descendants remains unknown. After this incubation period, something incredible happened. Genetic lineages began to split, and they split suddenly. The explanation for this is very clear. Around 16,000 to 13,000 years ago, ancestral Native Americans must have realized that there was land to the south that was within reach, and they moved in quickly. This would have been a rich new land, with herds of megafauna and rivers and lakes swollen with fish and waterfowl. In this environment, they spread out, and their population grew rapidly. It must have been an amazing time to be alive. Three ancient human remains shed a lot of light on this. The Anzic Child in Montana, the Spirit Cave Mummy in Nevada, and the people of the Lagoa Santa site in Brazil all date to between 12,700 and 10,000 years ago. When geneticists compare their DNA, they can see how these populations developed once they arrived in the Americas. Once they were south of the ice sheets, ancestral Native Americans split into two main branches, a northern branch and a southern branch. As the name suggests, the northern branch is ancestral to populations of northern North America, such as the Algonquin, Cilician, and Nadene, while the southern branch includes populations in the southern U.S., Mesoamerica, and South America. Scientists are confident that this split occurred south of the ice sheets, because neither of these populations ever intermarried with the ancient Beringian population as far as we know. By the way, these movements are also echoed in the DNA of American dogs. Dogs were already domesticated for thousands of years by this time, and canine genetic studies show that American dogs split into four lineages at almost the exact same time as that northern and southern split in the human population about 15,000 years ago. Pretty cool, right? I thought it was cool. Between 15,000 and 13,000 years ago, Central and South American populations split from the populations in North America. This is supported by a large body of archaeological sites in North and South America, sites like Meadowcroft Rock Shelter, Cactus Hill, the Topper Site, Buttermilk Creek, the Galt Site, and Paisley Caves all date to between 16,000 and 13,000 years ago. Down in South America, Monte Verde and Huaca Prieta date as far back as 14,500 years ago and 13,500 years ago, respectively. This shows that people were dispersing throughout the continents very quickly. Heck, if this was a video game, this would look like a speed run. Renowned geneticist Eski Villerslev has pointed out that genetic studies have shown that once humans settled in a certain area of the continent, they tended to stay in that area. Indigenous peoples have strong ties to the regions that their ancestors originally migrated to, be it the Amazon or Patagonia or Mexico. But how did these people get into the Americas, you may be asking? There are two points of entry from Asia into the Americas. The first, and most straightforward, is crossing over land. In these models, humans would have migrated from Beringia to the south into North America. The big problem with this is that during the migration time discussed previously, the glaciers still blocked this path. A land route would eventually open millennia later when global temperatures rose and the glaciers began to retreat. Current estimates show that an ice-free corridor would have been open around 15,000 to 14,000 years ago, but that doesn't mean that it was immediately viable for human migration. Upon the glacial retreat, the new corridor would have been a wasteland with no flora or fauna, which means that for hundreds of miles, travelers would not have been able to sustain themselves. This would have made long-distance travel impossible. It's not until 12,600 years ago that evidence of vegetation appears, with moose and elk appearing about a thousand years later. Obviously, given what we just discussed, this does not mesh well with the archaeological evidence that we mentioned earlier. 
Those sites predate that ice-free corridor opening by thousands of years. So let's look at the second point of entry. Well, if you can't go over a glacier, why not go around it? By boat. This is the coastal migration model, and it postulates that people came down the western coast of the Americas, exploiting unglaciated pockets and refugia on the route south. Studies have shown that by 17,000 years ago, the coastline would have been sufficiently deglaciated to allow a coastal migration. This may sound a little fantastic at first, but the waters off of the North American coast would have been very productive. They would have been dominated by kelp forests, which supported and still support a wealth of marine mammals, fish, seabirds, and seaweeds. In fact, this is often called the kelp highway hypothesis. There's actually a well-known site that has some interesting possible connections with this theory. So let's take a quick detour to Monteverde in southern Chile. Monteverde is most famous for being the site to break the Clovis barrier, but even with that aside, it's an incredible site. Its main layers date to 14,500 years ago, though earlier layers may date to up to 18,000 years ago, but that's more controversial. Unlike most of the sites we've discussed on this channel, Monteverde is in a peat bog. That may sound like a lousy place to have to excavate, but these can actually be archaeological gold mines, because anaerobic environments like peat bogs actually preserve a lot of organic materials that would otherwise be lost. Anyone who's familiar with bog bodies found in northern Europe knows exactly what I'm talking about. Excavations at the site were led by Tom Dillahay back in the 70s and continued for the next few decades. These revealed an incredibly well-preserved Paleo-Indian campsite that preserved things like ropes, hut frames, footprints, soft mammoth tissue, medicinal plants, and even food remains such as wild potatoes and seaweed. That last one is important because archaeologists recovered nine different species of seaweed. Most of these were probably used for food, but two of the species appear to have been used for medicinal purposes. All of these varieties had to be gathered from different sources at different times of the year. This would indicate that these early inhabitants were extremely adept at exploiting marine resources. Dillahay has also observed that the modern Mapuche, the local indigenous people, say that they came from the west, i.e. the coast, which I thought was really interesting. Finally, recall what we said earlier about possible places in Beringia that people may have sought refuge during the height of the LGM. If people were on the southern coast in the wetlands, as some speculate, it makes perfect sense that they would have been capable of harvesting marine resources and using watercraft. As cool as those coincidences are, don't get the idea that this is a slam dunk theory. It's a bit more complicated, and we are missing crucial information. First, no boats have been found in the archaeological record that date to that time. Now, this is to be expected. Boats and watercraft preserve an archaeology as well as a snowball on a hot day, and finding ancient watercraft is rare. To put that in perspective, the oldest boat ever recovered in archaeology is only 10,000 years old, and that's the Pesa Canoe in the Netherlands, and that's an exceptional find. However, archaeologists are confident that humans were making boats much earlier, because humans were able to reach Australia 50,000 years ago, even though it wasn't connected to Asia by land. Second, hard archaeological evidence is lacking and available evidence is circumstantial. Part of this has a simple explanation. Since the glaciers melted, much of the ancient coast is deep underwater, so the best evidence may not be very visible. However, other scientists have pointed out that even in areas where the Pleistocene coastline wasn't submerged by glacial melting, no evidence of human habitation prior to 13,000 to 12,000 years ago has been discovered. If you're curious how some of the shoreline wasn't submerged, it's due to isostatic forces creating four bulges. Basically, when a glacier retreats and the land is free of the massive weight of the glacier, it can actually rise, and in some cases, it offsets rising sea levels. Nevertheless, many scientists believe that this hypothesis holds a lot of promise. This is going to be a really interesting area of study for future archaeologists. Any rich eccentric billionaires watching this who want to fund some cool archaeology, might I suggest this. One final note I want to add to this is that there were subsequent migrations from Asia into the Americas long after the Americas were populated, and these made extensive use of watercraft. They had to, because by the time they occurred, Beringia was gone. The most recent were the ancestors of the modern Inuit people, who entered America about 800 years ago and settled in the Arctic. 
The Inuit are well known for their kayaks and marine prowess, but they weren't the first people to inhabit the Arctic. That honor goes to the Paleo-Inuit people who migrated from Siberia into the Arctic about 5,000 years ago. Although we have no direct evidence of watercraft from these people, there are good reasons to believe that they did have boats, based not only on their tools and substance, but also on the fact that they had to cross the Bering Strait. If you're interested in those migrations, I have an episode on the Dorset culture that goes into much more detail about them, but we aren't going to spend any more attention on those migrations in this episode. Now what I've given you is a neat and tidy narrative. Ancestral Native Americans descended from Northern Siberian and East Asian populations before they migrated into Beringia sometime during the last glacial maximum before migrating into the Americas with their dogs roughly around 16,000 years ago and spreading out rapidly across the continents. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? Well, I'm about to pull the rug out from under you. If you were expecting something simple that everyone agrees on, that's not what you're getting because it doesn't really exist. There's a lot of gaps and outliers in the body of evidence that we need to review. I've given you the base, and now we need to add to it so that we can appreciate the gaps in our understanding of the settlement of the Americas. To start, we're going to look at the archaeology of a site that has become very famous in the past two years, the White Sands Footprints. So what makes this site so special and so exciting? Like the name suggests, this site in White Sands National Park in New Mexico has fossilized footprints in what was once an ancient lake bed. These footprints are clearly man-made, so there's no ambiguity about this site being the result of animals or other natural forces. Archaeologists were able to recover seeds from spiral ditch grass that the feet had pressed into the mud and then used radiocarbon dating to date them to between 21,000 and 23,000 years ago. This was a sensation when it was announced, but initially I didn't cover White Sands in a subsequent video, not just because I was busy with other projects, but also because behind all the flashy headlines and clickbait, there was legitimate criticism of those dates. Those seeds that were carbon dated could have been much younger than the dates suggested due to the carbon reservoir. The carbon reservoir is the phenomenon that occurs when organisms in water absorb carbon that is much older than the organism itself, which skews the dating and makes the organism's remains appear older than they actually are. Since these seeds are from aquatic plants, critics argue that they may have been younger than the carbon dating suggested. However, just a few months ago, a new study was published on the footprints that dated pollen samples, which would not have been subject to the marine reservoir effect. On top of that, they used optically stimulated luminescence to date the sediment itself, and in both cases, the dates came back very close to the original 21,000 to 23,000 year old date. So this makes the dates at White Sands very robust, and almost certainly puts humans in the Americas over 20,000 years ago. Quick aside before we continue, I know that there are claims of older sites in the Americas, but most archaeologists are very skeptical of these sites for reasons that I will actually be discussing later in the episode. This is my opinion, but I think it's safe to say that White Sands is the oldest, most securely dated site in the Americas. So if the dating of this site is legitimate, and as I hope I explained, I think there are very good reasons to say that it is, it proves that humans were in the Americas during the LGM. This then begs the question, how were people in the Americas at the height of the LGM? Did they cross Beringia before the ice sheets closed off North America? A few years ago, that would have been a pretty fringe idea, but it's not too far-fetched today. It's worth remembering that before the LGM, there would have been a continuous step from Central Asia through Beringia and down into Central America, so people could have followed megafauna across the steppe into North America. This has been formally proposed by Stephen and Catherine Holin as the Mammoth Step Hypothesis. If you're wondering why no genetic evidence confirms this, it's entirely possible that a pre-LGM population may have existed in the Americas, but didn't leave any genetic lineage in modern populations. That may sound like a depressing shrug of an explanation, but this is a very real possibility. This is actually what happened to the original Arctic inhabitants in North America, the Paleo-Inuit people. Despite once populating the entire North American Arctic, they have left no modern descendants that scientists have detected. Again, check out the episode on the Dorset culture for more info. Also, don't forget about the ancient Beringians from earlier. They left no descendants either. And speaking of mysterious populations, 
there's also some very tantalizing genetic evidence of other migrations into the Americas. Back in 2015, a study of several indigenous Amazonian groups showed that they had genes not just from the ancestral Native Americans in Beringia, but also from another population, dubbed the Ipiquira population, known as Population Y for short. No ancient DNA containing traces of this population have been found in the Americas, so the only evidence we have is from current populations. What makes this even more interesting is that people with genes from Population Y share genes with some contemporary indigenous Australasian populations. Now before you get excited, geneticists can tell from the dispersal that this is very, very old, and it's probably not from a trans-Pacific migration across the Pacific. Now, Polynesians did eventually reach the Americas about 800 years ago, but that's a completely different topic that we'll avoid today and save for later. Experts debate whether Population Y came into Beringia from Asia and mixed with the current populations there before dispersing into the Americas, or if it was a separate population that entered the Americas at a different time. It may be possible, though perhaps unlikely, that Population Y could have migrated from East Asia into the Americas prior to the LGM. The timing and nature of Population Y's origins are poorly understood, and more study is needed to determine how they entered the Americas. Again, geneticists are drawing from very limited sample sizes, and there's a poor understanding of indigenous genetics in North America, so we don't know how they fit into this picture. There's also another group that migrated from Beringia into the Americas, though they probably entered after the LGM. Remember that third population in Beringia during the standstill that I referred to earlier? That is referred to as unsampled population A. Scientists only know of this population indirectly through DNA analysis of modern Miche people in Mexico, who have traces of this population in their genes. Current estimates place the population's movement into America around 9,000 years ago, but how they arrived and settled in the Americas remains unknown. This all goes to show that we have a long way to go in our understanding of the settlement of the Americas. Now we get to the part of the episode that I'm sure will ignite the comments section because I want to take some time to address some controversies and alternate theories related to the settlement of the Americas. Some of these are long-standing debates and others are lesser-known or more obscure controversies that viewers have brought to my attention that I have long wanted to address. Before we get into this, I just want to restate that our understanding of this topic is continuously evolving and changing and that it's possible that further investigations may prove one of these to be correct. So take this analysis with a grain of salt. Perhaps the longest controversy surrounding the migration of people into the Americas is the Clovis First Hypothesis. I went into this in a lot of detail in my original First Americans episode, so you can watch it there if you want more information. But to make a very long story short, it was long believed that the Clovis tradition was the tool tradition of the first people in the Americas. This was popular for decades because the archaeological evidence back in the 50s and 60s showed that Clovis was the oldest known tool tradition and the dates for those Clovis sites are in a very narrow window about 13,500 to 12,800 years ago, and that actually times nicely with the ice-free corridor opening up. We now know in retrospect that there are lots of well-dated pre-Clovis sites like Meadowcroft and Monte Verde, as well as earlier tool traditions like the Western Stemmed Point tradition. Archaeologists also spent decades searching Alaska and Siberia for Clovis technology or some obvious ancestor to Clovis technology. They expected that there would be evidence linking those ancient populations with later Clovis people. Unfortunately, those studies came up empty. While there are some fluted lancelet points that can be found in Alaska, the dates are later than Clovis. If anything, the evidence showed Clovis technology moving north through the ice-free corridor, not south. This theory is all but debunked now, but occasionally you'll find a skeptic saying that the Clovis tradition represents the earliest securely dated tradition in the Americas. Our next controversy was actually born out of the slow death of the Clovis First hypothesis, and that is the Salutrian hypothesis. I recently did an analysis of this with archaeologist Nathaniel Fossain, so if you want to see our full opinion on this theory and why it doesn't really hold water, check it out. For those who want the short summary, here we go. 
Back in the late 90s and early 2000s, Dennis Stanford and Bruce Bradley put forth a bold hypothesis proposing that the Clovis tradition was actually the result of a migration from Western Europe during the LGM. They based this idea off of the similarities between Salutrian points in Western Europe and Clovis points in the U.S. Both tool traditions use a technique called overshot flaking to achieve a very thin and elegant point. That's a pretty insane coincidence, actually, but there are important differences. Salutrian points do not have the signature fluting of Clovis points, nor their shape. However, the weakest part of this theory, besides the fact that no Salutrian points have ever been found in the Americas, is that the theory speculates that Salutrians arrived in the Americas around 18,000 years ago and brought their technology with them. The big problem with that is that Clovis doesn't appear for another 5,000 years, so there's an enormous gap between these purportedly derivative technologies. Sometimes supporters of this theory will point to the X haplogroup that is found in some Native Americans as well as Western Europeans and North Africans and claim that there's a link. First, these populations belong to completely different clades, or subgroups, within the X haplogroup. The X2A and X2G clades are found in America, and the X2B, X2D, and X2C are found across the ocean in Europe and North Africa. These clades are not descended from each other, but rather they likely derive from a common ancestor in East Asia. They're basically cousins, not parents and children. Now, I don't want to say that it's impossible that people could have sailed across the Atlantic to the Americas. They may very well have been capable of doing so. But right now, there's no proof that there was ever a great migration of people from Europe into the Americas that produced a technological revolution. Other controversies usually involve a very early entry of humans into the Americas, and these usually draw upon the archaeology of certain controversial sites. Let's take a look at some of these, starting with the Calico Early Man site in California. Proponents of this site claim that very simple tools were found in layers dating between 200,000 to 50,000 years ago. One of these proponents was actually Louis Leakey, the man responsible for the very important excavations at Olduvai Gorge and championing the out-of-Africa theory in human evolution. Unfortunately, the consensus is that these purported tools were geofacts rather than man-made tools. Geofacts are natural stones that may initially appear to be man-made, but are instead created by natural forces. Down in Mexico, Chiquahide Cave made headlines a few years ago when it was announced that stone tools were discovered in layers dating back to between 32,000 and 25,000 years ago. While this date isn't entirely out of the question, the tool evidence is weak. The tools are made out of the same limestone found in the cave and do not appear to be clearly worked by humans. Most archaeologists believe that these are likely geofacts that are a result of natural breakdown in the cave. If they were made of a different material from the cave, the proponents would have a much stronger argument. Down in South America, the site of Pedra Ferrada in Brazil has dates that supposedly go back 40,000 years ago. Now, these early dates come from charcoal deposits and simple cobbles that scientists have expressed a lot of skepticism about. They point out that there's no proof that this charcoal was man-made. Another recent criticism has emerged that has been aimed at the stone cobbles. Scientists have noted that capuchin monkeys can use stones as tools, and the resulting breakages explain the purported cobble tools at the site. Moving back to California, another famous site is the Cerruti Mastodon site. Back in 1993, a construction crew at the site found mastodon bones that had been broken alongside cobbles that may have been used to break open the bones and to get at the marrow inside. When these bones were dated, they were shown to be a whopping 120,000 years old. This would almost certainly predate modern Homo sapiens. Archaeologists contend that these bones could have been broken by construction equipment, animals, or other natural forces, and that the lack of any butchering marks or definite man-made tools rule out that this was a man-made site. Archaeologists have stated that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and the evidence here is very circumstantial, and I personally think that this is a very fair assessment. Finally, a quick look at the controversial site with the oldest dates on record, Huayatlauco in Mexico. We don't have time to go into the weeds on this site, but it was excavated in the 60s and 70s and produced tools and butchered animal bones but dates for the remains in these layers came back at an insane 260,000 to 60,000 years old. 
Those older dates are way before Homo sapiens ever left Africa, which would probably make this an archaic human site if it's legit. There were allegations of artifacts getting planted there by workers, which had to be proven wrong, and they were. In fairness, the archaeologists leading these excavations were extremely critical of these dates and did their best to find out why they were so old, but redating efforts haven't cleared it up. This is, simply put, an anomaly. I got the impression that some archaeologists are okay with assigning this site a 22,000-year-old date, but they just can't explain the anomalous dates that have come back. It's probably why you don't see it mentioned very often, if at all. Interesting site, though. One final word before I leave you. If you hear someone making an extraordinary or controversial claim about an archaeological site or a scientific study, I'd encourage you to do research. And when I say research, watching a YouTube video doesn't count, unless it's a video by an expert on that topic. Now don't get smug, dear viewer, because I am not an expert on the topics I cover. I'm just presenting the work of other experts, and as hard as I try to get things right, I make mistakes. If you truly want to know more, consult good research by legitimate experts. I always encourage people who want to know more to look online for academic articles and books. If something is behind a paywall or unavailable, go to your local library and ask for their assistance in getting a copy. They will be thrilled to help you. Feed your curiosity in a healthy way. Remember, you can always check my bibliographies in the description of my videos if you want to know where and how I did my research. As we wrap this up, I hope I've painted a clear picture of how complicated and fraught this topic is, but also why it's so exciting. This story is still being written, but what we have so far is amazing. It's a story of a people surviving one of the harshest climatic events in history, and then moving into a great new and unknown land, adapting and spreading out with incredible speed and success, and eventually developing the beautiful and wonderful cultural landscape of the Americas. Once again, special thanks to my patrons for supporting my work. You guys are the best. If you would like to join the ranks of these fine individuals and support the show, you can do so on Patreon. The link will be in the description. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Facebook. We'll see you in our next episode. Take care.